All right, students, let's talk about chemical reaction equations. Let's get started. Here's the essential question. How do I write a chemical equation and what mistakes should I avoid? Let's start with the definition of a chemical reaction. A chemical reaction is a process, that's a process that involves the rearrangement of the molecular structure of substances into new substances. So here's an example of a chemical reaction. We have methane being combusted. Now here are the methane particles and they need oxygen particles in order to combust. Now these particles, when they go through a reaction, they're gonna rearrange themselves into new substances. Here, for example, we have carbon dioxide and water. Now we can't see molecules with our naked eye, so it's not always easy to tell that a chemical change is taking place. So what we need to do is look for chemical the evidences of chemical change when we're doing reactions. For example, if you mix two substances and light is emitted, and light could be in the form of like fire or phosphorescence, like in a glow stick, that is evidence that a chemical change is most likely taking place and molecules are rearranging themselves. The other evidences are whether a precipitate or a solid is forming, and typically we've used solubility rules in the past to figure that out. If gas or bubbles are being emitted, if there's a color change that doesn't happen because of a dye, then that is good evidence that chemical change is taking place. Same if it's getting hot or cold, or if there's an odor being emitted where there was no odor before. Here's a chemical reaction equation. This is how we model chemical reactions, um, just showing the molecular formulas. Now I'm gonna just go over the different parts. The first part of the reactants, the reactants are on the left side of this reaction arrow right here. And they represent the things, the, the substances we're starting with. So in this reaction, we have hydrogen and oxygen. Those are our reactants or our ingredients in this chemical reaction. Now the reaction arrow represents a change. The change is taking place and it's going through a reaction. On the right side of the arrow, we get a product or products. And these are the substances that are produced from the reactants. They're the things that were changed into from the reactants. Now, if you'll notice that there's some numbers, these green numbers in front of each of the molecules, these are known as coefficients, and they represent the molecular quantity or molar quantities of things. It's kind of like the, the amount you would need in order to do this recipe. Now, everything has a coefficient, although we sometimes don't write the number one. So even oxygen in this equation has a coefficient, it's the coefficient is one, but we don't typically write the number one because it's implied by being there. The last thing are the little tiny um, phase or state symbols found on the bottom right hand corner. Now the different phases or states the substance can be in is solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous. Now aqueous is a special um, type of phase symbol we only use in chemical equation to represent that the substance was dissolved in water. All right, before we start writing our own chemical reaction equations, I have a few hints I wanna make sure that you are aware of. The first hint deals with ionic and covalent compounds. Be sure you review how to write ionic and covalent compounds because knowing how to write them correctly is essential. Let's take a few practice chances right now. Here's magnesium bromide. Magnesium bromide is an ionic compound. We know it's an ionic compound because it's made of a metal and a non-metal. Carbon dinitride is a covalent compound. We know this because carbon dinitride is made of carbon and nitrogen, which are both nonmetals. So ionic compounds have a metal and nonmetals in it. Covalent compounds only have nonmetals. Copper three oxide, there's a metal and a nonmetal, so that's an ionic compound. Lithium sulfate is a metal and multiple nonmetals, so that's an ionic compound. And then diphosphorus tetrachloride, that's phosphorus and chlorine, so that's only nonmetals, which makes it a covalent compound. Knowing the type of compound lets us know how to write these equations. Let's go back to magnesium bromide. We know it's ionic, therefore we have to worry about the charges of each. Magnesium is a plus two and bromine is a minus one based on its location on the periodic table. Therefore, in order to write the formula for magnesium bromide, we would need one magnesium and two bromines put together. Carbon dinitride is a covalent compound, so we don't need to worry about charge when we put them together. So how do we know how many there are? Well, that's where these prefix come into play. And the prefix are found on the back of your periodic table. Carbon dinitride is one carbon and di means two, so two nitrogens. So carbon dinitride is CN2. 
All right, copper three oxide is an ionic compound. Copper three, copper is a transition metal. And notice the Roman numerals three next to it. That lets us know that the copper's charge is a plus three. Oxygen's charge is a minus two based on its position on the periodic table. Therefore, to put them together, we need two coppers and three oxygen so they cancel each other out. So copper three oxide's formula is Cu2O3. Lithium sulfate is ionic, so we need to worry about charge. Lithium is a plus one. Sulfate is a polyatomic ion found on the bottom part of the front of our periodic table. Sulfate is SO4 and its charge is minus two. Therefore, we need two lithiums and only one sulfate in order to make lithium sulfate. Diphosphorus tetrachloride is covalent, so we worry about the prefixes. Diphosphorus means two phosphorus. Tetrachloride, tetra means four, so four chlorines. All right, the second helpful hint when we write chemical reaction equations is acids. Now, we didn't get a chance to talk about acids this semester, but later on, if you were to take AP Chemistry or Chemistry 2, we'll learn a little bit more about acids. For this, it's really easy. Just check on the back of your periodic table. There's a list of acids back there. So if you ever see acids in a chemical reaction equation, just write what you see on the back of the periodic table. The third helpful hint is all about diatomic molecules. Now we briefly learned about these before. Mostly we just wanted you to memorize which of the molecules were diatomic. Heck, you can even use your periodic table and make a little note on which ones are diatomic. Now these are special molecules that whenever you see them as pure elements in a chemical reaction, they have to have a little subscript of two and they're the only ones that do that naturally when they're pure elements. So I'm gonna give you an example of that. Here we have hydrogen gas reacting with oxygen gas to form water. Now, when hydrogen, when we write hydrogen, we don't just write H, we write H2 because it's one of the special seven diatomic molecules. Same with oxygen. Oxygen is one of the special seven as well, so we write O2. So both hydrogen and oxygen are diatomic. Now, water, on the other hand, is not diatomic because it's not a pure element, it's a compound. It's just a coincidence that water has H2 in it. That H is not diatomic in this sense. Notice that the oxygen doesn't even have a 2. Again, because it's not diatomic, it's part of a compound. All right, let's do a little bit of a practice right now. We're going to write the reaction equation where magnesium reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. I like to take that really wordy problem and make a really simple word reaction or a word equation going on. So this takes out all the fluff. We have magnesium plus hydrochloric acid. I like to think of the plus as kind of like an and in this case. And those react, shown by the reaction arrow, to re create magnesium chloride and hydrogen. So in order to write this formula, we're going to need to kind of use all those different hints and all the different parts that we've learned previously. Let's start with magnesium. Magnesium is just a periodic table element. So really simply, we just write Mg. Next, let's look at hydrochloric acid. The word acid is a major hint that we should probably go look at the acids list on, our, on the back of our periodic table and write the appropriate one. So in this case, hydrochloric acid is HCl. All right, those two reactants react to form two products, magnesium chloride and hydrogen. Well, magnesium chloride is a compound. Specifically, it's an ionic compound because it's a metal and a non-metal. So we have to worry about the charges. So Mg and Cl come together to make MgCl2. The last piece is hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is a special molecule because it's one of those special diatomic elements. So we can't just write H like we did with magnesium. We have to write H2 because it's diatomic. Before we end, I want to go back to this reaction, and I just want to talk about how it's currently unbalanced. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if we take a look here on the left side of the reaction or the reactants, we have one hydrogen and one chlorine. In the product side, however, we have two chlorines and two hydrogens. Now, we didn't screw up this reaction. We have written it correctly. It's just not finished. It's unbalanced in terms of the reactants and products. Remember, those reactants become those products. So where do these extra chlorines and hydrogens come from? Well, we need to learn how to apply some something called the law of conservation of mass to fix it. And we're going to talk about that more in a later set of notes. But just as a little preview, what we haven't done is we haven't added any coefficients. By adding a coefficient to this reactant, hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid, then we change this reaction and it becomes balanced. We haven't changed any of the chemical formulas. We just change the quantity of the reactants. And by doing so, we now balance this reaction.
All right, that leads us to the end of the notes. Let's take a moment to review and highlight key terms, ponder and ask questions, and summarize by answering the essential question. Good luck.